Ingen på gæld. So, uh, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. Um, it is uh, the webinar Rise of Cemetery Abandonment, Legal Responsibilities, in a, and uh, Obstacles for Towns and Villages. Today we have uh, David Fleming um, from Stonehoff, Willie, and Klein in Albany. And he's very thankful that he has he didn't have to drive all the way to Watertown to do this presentation. Um, this is the this is the session that we were going to do at the local government conference. Um, and uh, David has been gracious enough to um, take this time to do it on a webinar for us. Uh, we will we are, as Emily said we are recording the session. And hopefully we'll have it on on the Tug Hill Commission's website at a later date, along with the point that David will be going through today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. He has about an hour and a half presentation. Uh, we're going to hold all questions till the end, and then we will um, answer questions if you want to um, at point submit a question you can do on the webinar. Um, okay. Use the chat box right at the bottom to enter your question and we'll have David answer, answer them all verbally at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Much, and I appreciate the opportunity to join you all uh, this afternoon, uh, particularly joining you from Albany, which I appreciate a great deal. I changed the title just a little bit, and I added hope, as you can see. And I think, um, you know, in the last few weeks, I've received a number of calls where folks are feeling rather hopeless about um, the abandonment of cemeteries. And I hope to give you a little information today that will give you hope on how to handle these situations, as well as maybe how to prevent them. And I think that's uh, really a good place for us to start. And I'd like to start by giving a little background uh, about my experience so you feel a little more comfortable about what we're talking about and, and where we're at. Um, I have served as uh, town supervisor for six terms as well as a term as deputy supervisor, so clearly my intelligence is uh, in question at the moment. Um, 23 years of representing cemeteries and towns. As a town supervisor, I'm also responsible for three abandoned town cemeteries, two of which uh, I've received while as supervisor. And if you want to see how technical I am, there I am on the right-hand side of your screen actually putting down topsoil <laughs> on one of our graves. So we're, we're pretty involved in every aspect uh, of our cemeteries, so we have a lot of background as well. In my capacity, I am an advisor to most of New York's uh, largest cemeteries, consultant to also some of the smallest cemeteries in New York. Uh, we consult with state representatives, uh, consult with local governments, uh, consult on abandonment and restoration in particular emergency situations. Uh, 25 years of legislative, regulatory, and administrative experience uh, here in Albany uh, working on these types of issues. I should note that I am an unapologetic privationist, uh, fan of history, and certainly all the history that can be found in our cemeteries across New York. From generally, is that I am a little biased, and I like to be open about my bias at, at the onset, which is I believe cemeteries are a historic treasure for our future generations, and also practical open space for any community across New York, uh, particularly our urban communities, uh, but provide uh, habitat, respite, and obviously a practical reason for their existence. Many cemeteries are well run and beautiful, and they're maintained for future generations, so I don't want our discussion today uh, to disparage the hard work of so many volunteers across the state of New York uh, that work each and every day to serve families and to uh, provide this opportunity uh, within their own communities. Unfortunately, there has been an increase in abandonments, and that seems to be uh, a real focus as opposed to the positive things, but there are many positive things uh, that are happening across the state with cemeteries, particularly as they evolve to meet the needs of societal shifts. And I'm always happy to talk about that, and we can talk about that at another time. 
that are on the front lines of what we are facing uh, in what has become really a fiscal crisis for localities. And, and you're going to issues all the time. And it, what's important to note is that I strongly believe that our towns and villages are part of the solution to A, preventing abandonment, and B, correcting the situation to the benefit of the communities uh, in which these cemeteries are located. I think it's important as we look at um, sorry, abandonment and, and how, where we are, because there is a real practical reason uh, for why we are in this particular predicament. And uh, obviously, it is increasing um, exponentially across New York, particularly in upstate, um, the Tug Hill area, but also I was just hearing today from the Plattsburgh area where abandonment is becoming more and more of a problem. So for the first years of our nation's birth, you had an eclectic collection of, of every kind of cemetery you can possibly imagine um, across New York, which were both for-profit and not-for-profit ventures. There were all sorts of, of uh, schemes related to uh, speculation for grave sales, directors who would uh, create cemeteries specifically for their own uh, use, all sorts of things. And uh, this came really a public, there was a public outcry uh, on, because of many of these issues. And the process didn't work out so well. And of course, so there's no need to worry that we always come up with laws to take care of something. And in 1949, this led to hearings uh, demanded by the state legislature held by the New York State Attorney General on the cemetery industry. And it was an explosive report, it's actually still available, that outlines all of the different um, crises of confidence in cemetery operations. Now, there were many cemeteries that were uh, started for benefit, um, that started trust funds, and did sorts of things to guarantee a future for the cemeteries. But unfortunately, that was not a widespread phenomenon. So we're now we're talking in 1949. Many cemeteries that we're talking about today uh, we're in the late 1700s to the 1800s, uh, and certainly the foundation for failure had already been laid for many of those cemeteries. We'd only, we know, have only had 69 years to partially repair 173 years of damage that occurred for many of these cemeteries previously. But it is important to note that since that 1949 report, New legislative structure for dealing with cemeteries and managing and uh, regulating cemeteries become a national leader uh, across the country uh, as far as regulation. We, our bills, our laws are looked to as templates for other states on how to uh, properly address cemetery management, uh, Christian, and consumer services. We went from this scheme where we had all of these cemeteries that were um, for-profit, not-for-profit, and any combination in between where people were siphoning money from the entities, even if they were nonprofits. Now all cemeteries in New York are required to be not-for-profit entities. And uh, because of that 1949 report, the charge of the legislature following that report, uh, making these cemeteries essentially quasi-government agencies, because they are, they are providing a unique public purpose, which is the burial of the dead and the memorialization of the dead. Um, so it was complete transformation of all these entities in 1949. In 2000, there were 1,800 regulated cemeteries in the state. This gives you an idea, uh, really kind of what we've been uh, talking about as far as the long-term impact. So 2011, were 1,800 regulated cemeteries. By 2017, that number had fallen to 1,745. Since 90, more than 170 regulated cemeteries have failed. Now, and I should note that, that those are our um, estimated numbers because what happened across the state, while there are formal abandonments, and many of you know this because of your own practical experience, um, a cemetery will literally go through the abandonment process. Many smaller rural cemeteries have that were not necessarily within. Um, 
the alleged purview of the State Division of Cemeteries uh, were abandoned and were abandoned to the um, municipalities without official notice to the state. So this number could be uh, quite a lot higher. I think there's a crisis brewing in every municipality in New York. I can tell you I have a bridge I'd be happy to tell you. Um, if you're interested, you can feel free to contact me after this presentation. So the last cemetery report uh, on cemetery solvency and, and management was in 1991. So we're going quite a, back quite a ways, and we're actually looking to update that right now so we can get more effective numbers in which to uh, advocate on behalf of municipalities. That was done by the LFC. Sloan Consulting Group, and it was determined that 74% of New York State's large cemeteries are underfunded. 60 New York State's small cemeteries are underfunded. Those numbers do not account for the approximately 6,000 other cemeteries in New York. So those would be um, cemeteries that are not regulated by the state of New York, private and religious cemeteries uh, across New York. Maybe an unknown cemetery in your uh, cemetery issue in your community that you should uh, be looking for. For many of you, you are on the front line, so you are in government, you are in local government, or in volunteer organizations that are supporting your local government. It's really important to start a dialogue as soon as possible. Uh, really, tomorrow after this presentation, if you can, uh, really getting an understanding of what cemetery issues are in your community. And that is so important. Is I'll give you one example. Whispering Maples Memorial Gardens in the towns of Plattsburgh and Ellenburg. And uh, if there's anyone on the phone that is and in this presentation that has experienced this, they can tell you firsthand how big of a problem this was. Uh, towns of Whisper, uh, the towns of Plattsburgh and Ellenburg had two stalin mausoleums, one in Plattsburgh, one in the town of Ellenburg, um, held by uh, one cemetery entity. The uh, cemetery went, well, it was, uh, its records were burned in a, mysteriously in a building that had no power, um, as well as um, the money seemed to disappear. No repairs were really being made to the facilities. This is one of only three standalone mausoleums that were approved in the state of New York in the last, I'd say, 40 years. I want to note that from the street, as you can see, everything looks fine, and you're driving by, and the municipality drives by, everything looks fine. You're in a newspaper, you read the newspaper, you see obituaries, people are being entombed um, on a basis. But heard the stories from some people in the community, you'd know something was wrong. Well, in this case, again, from the road, everything looks great. From the back, not so much. Gives you an idea that there's something, that there was something really wrong. And then you actually tour around the building. You have these two small towns in upstate New York now face a bill of $2.5 million for repairs. I think that's about double the town of Ellenburg's uh, annual budget. And uh, this is really something that's required special legislation uh, in the legislature just to address this particular issue uh, because of this abandonment. Not That help is not always available. This is actionary case where the legislators got together to really help uh, repair and correct this terrible situation. So really a, a powerful reminder to us that we need to be proactive. Not everything is, is as it seems from the street, and we have conversations with the folks who are our other volunteers in the community who are running cemeteries, getting an idea, an assessment of the status of the cemeteries in our community. Uh, there's ongoing pressures on cemetery abandonment for towns and villages, and you should all keep these in mind because it, it seems intuitive, but really we don't really think of these things often, and certainly, obviously, cemeteries aren't something that we're always thinking about. Um, is the fact that there's been massive societal shifts affecting cemeteries across New York and certainly impacting more abandonment. And the impacts result in part from the economic out migration in upstate New York. Certainly for the folks on the phone, you know, many of us are experiencing that situation. We're in this um, out migration of folks who don't have a connection to, you know, the folks who are uh, leaving no longer have that 
connect into these burial grounds, so those are people that aren't coming back uh, most likely uh, to be interred. And certainly uh, there are significant changes in religious practices, church versus unchurch folks uh, in this new century. Add up of that, is, and back up and say that when you consider that when, when folks are participating in a religious process, a lot of the uh, liturgy and rites of burial, therefore, also go away. So there are um, folks who have less of a connection to cemeteries. New York cremation rate, which is slightly less than 50% statewide. Uh, in the areas of the state, 60% plus uh, the cremation rate. Think of all those cremations, how many times you know somebody who puts grandma or grandpa on the, on the mantle and not in a cemetery. So a revenue not going into the cemetery because of a societal shift with such significant increases in cremation rate uh, compared by the fact that uh, the NIA, the, near, uh, the National Funeral Directors Association, projects that by uh, 2035, 78% of all deaths will result in cremation. Um, that's a growing number uh, for the sustainability of cemeteries nationally, but in New York in particular. Um, in some areas, so folks on the phone, you're already seeing, you know, 65, 68% uh, cremation levels. And you know, cemeteries need to be a little more nimble in how they try to bring those remains into their burial grounds to uh, keep make economically viable. Uh, unfortunately, many uh, folks resist some of those changes. So, villages, we need to explore really two paths in this conversation today. One is to keep cemeteries in your communities from becoming abandoned, and the other is to deal with those that are already abandoned. So two really different paths, uh, but I think uh, in combination based on what your experiences are in your community, both of them may come into play uh, as you're dealing with uh, potential or abandoned cemeteries. So cemetery takeovers and cemetery abandonment or delay it for years to come. I really like the idea of delaying it for years to come. Cemeteries should be run by the community um, and volunteers, and the last resort should be that they would be run by the government, and I, I think many of us believe that that's the case. I think folks who are uh, serving um, the traditions of the community uh, are in a much better position than getting another agency within a town government that can't afford it uh, to provide cemetery services. By the community, not government, obviously, is a much better source. Uh, in your community talked about that. Really engage uh, as soon as possible. Start having conversations with people if you have not done so. I know many of you are facing, we'll talk about it later, um, you know, practical situations of multiple abandonments. You're just trying to work through that. I think hand them while you are dealing with abandonments. You should also be talking to friends who are cemetery boards, and just having casual conversations about um, how are things going, do they think they have enough money, or are there any real problems uh, they see. Those are important tools that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Conversation with cemetery directors really is one of the key things. Um, having a general conversation about essentially solvency and have enough volunteers. So been prohibited from expending any funds to help local cemeteries. Um, we found this out really the hard way, practically. A few towns uh, had been cited by the state controller's office uh, in audits because they had been expending funds to help struggling cemeteries within their community. They were doing so without statutory authority. And credit to the controller's office, they were very energetic about the situation, but their hands were tied by statute. And so the conversation was if the statute was different, they certainly wouldn't have a problem with that. So the New York State Association of Cemeteries, with the support of uh, the Association of Towns, helped pass Chapter 69 of 2010. And uh, Municipal Assistance Law, Section 165A of uh, the General Municipal Law. And this law allows voluntary municipal assistance to cemeteries. Now, they're regulated cemeteries, so regular not-for-profit cemeteries. Um, some communities are now allowed to provide um, or in lieu of funding uh, municipal assistance through goods and or services 
services to a public cemetery corporation. So again, only Article 15 cemeteries are um, cemeteries that are regulated by the state of New York, open public cemeteries. This is an important uh, change in the statute because it provides certainly municipalities that don't have a lot of money uh, the ability to do some goods and services to a cemetery uh, without actually having to expend the funds that they probably don't have. So from the municipality's perspective, a small donation of goods or services is, is much more attractive uh, than a complete takeover of the cemetery operations. And obviously, given the analysis of what the needs are in the community, the, the supervisor in the town board is going to have to be uh, cognizant of how much the need is. But some really practical examples are, you know, listed before you: mowing, general maintenance, uh, road work, tree removal, snow removal, bookkeeping. Um, really uh, small things they seem to be, but they're extremely important. I'll give you a couple of examples. So uh, after some recent storms, uh, um, capital region, really earlier part of the year, we saw the practical impacts of this, where we had. Um, trees have come down across roadways and uh, blocked the ability of uh, funeral processions to get into a couple cemeteries. One of them uh, literally said that they were totally unable to remove the tree, which was going to stop the burial. And in addition to stopping the burial, you can imagine the impact on the maintenance of the cemetery. Because they didn't have money to actually have the tree removed. It was so large and had done a bit of damage. Well, if that's all you need, and we don't have to, you know, we don't, we can delay this takeover. And we, if that's really all you need to keep maintaining the operations of the cemetery, we're sending the highway crew over, and the highway crew came over, and they removed a very large tree. Um, practical thing, but that's a couple thousand dollars in cash that would have been an outlay for that cemetery, which would have been fatal to them. They're able to continue mowing and operating. I only had a cemetery that came to me and said they wanted to become abandoned and asked why they, they, why they wanted to be abandoned. I asked how much money they had. They certainly had a significant amount of money. They still had board members. They said, well, the money issue has become too hard for us. We're getting older. None of us have to every year go out and try to find a new person if somebody quits um, to mow the cemetery and maintain it. Uh, we had to put ads in the paper, et cetera. That is the town. Look, we have to go out anyway to bid on a number of things throughout the year. We're more than happy to, to do in our bidding process to go out for you, pay to have the ad put out for the mowing uh, cemetery. That was over five years ago. They're still operating. I drove by this morning. It's incredibly well maintained. Um, they have they have a contractor that they're comfortable with that they didn't even have to do anything. All they had to do was sign the contract. So. Um, Practical things like that. Snow removal is also mentioned. That's one of those things that, you know, in in situations, a highway crew can be helpful in removing the snow from entryways uh, to cemeteries to allow uh, winter burials. Because I know, you know, snow is not a problem in upstate New York. Um, just really helping uh, the state open its roads so that they can go ahead and do burials. A cemetery can also take over an abandoned cemetery, and I think this is something that uh, many folks are not aware of because, you know, in the reality, and what we talked about earlier, is who better operate a cemetery than another cemetery? It's about cemetery operations and not about government operations. So the law was amended again in 2009. It was Chapter 363 of 2009. It amended the not-for-profit corporation law to allow abandoned cemeteries uh, to be taken by solvent cemeteries, cemeteries who are financially in good shape, and it allows those um, cemeteries that are taking over abandoned cemeteries to access the state restoration fund. Extremely important because what it do, what it can do, is significantly strengthen both cemeteries. And if a cemetery in your community that is close to abandonment struggling, and you have a cemetery that's done very well, perhaps. Um, Tather left them a significant amount of money in the 1800s, which they've managed very well. Uh, but they're out of space. But the abandoned cemetery still has a lot of space, but has no money. 
Uh, the addition of the two can be extremely beneficial to the long-term viability of both cemeteries. So it's a tool and something for uh, municipal municipalities as well as uh, community groups that work with cemeteries to keep in mind that uh, 1506C of the Not-for-Profit Corporation Law is there. Um, it is a great program, has been used a few times uh, since its passage to uh, allow these uh, cemeteries to take over abandoned cemeteries. All saying, okay, that's great, Dave, sounds wonderful. Um, that is, that's not going to help. <laughs> uh, we're already in a difficult situation, and, uh, you know, stop it ahead of time isn't going to help us. So we'll deal with that now. Dealing with historical or current abandonment, um, the, t the t town takeover of abandoned cemeteries, and I, and I know firsthand that a municipality trying to take over an abandoned cemetery, difficult tax cap environment, uh, extremely painful. When you're juggling between paying your road crews and uh, paying for your uh, general services, paying for cemetery maintenance and operation is certainly not what you want to do. And I hear from folks on a regular basis because of our, of our uh, efforts to assist municipalities in dealing with abandonment. The usual response I get is, I want it and I don't have to take it. Um, well, <laughs> you know, be the initial response. And for a village, that may, that may be true. Um, I will tell you, the folks who are here on the phone uh, for, uh, from villages, a little anecdote that I had a uh, rural cemetery, which is in front of you, a rural cemetery uh, wholly within the village of uh, Nassau, in our community of Nassau. There was one board member left. They had any money for a number of years. They were volunteer. The volunteers were mowing only the top of the cemetery. Um, it had become extremely difficult because of age to continue operating the cemetery. Um, they came to the town and said, "We can't do this anymore. Um, we, we've taken over." And so, obviously, I reached out to the village. It was in the village, and uh, you know, because of its significant historical. Um, Around and the fact that it was wholly within the village, I thought the village might be interested. Uh, they expressed their uh, desire not to take it over and uh, walked away from the table. So the team uh, was required to take it over. So villages are not required under statute to take over um, a cemetery, but um, they can if they used to. And we can talk a little bit later. So in a town, you can scream all you want about the you don't want to take over an abandoned cemetery, you don't have to deal with it, you can scream till the cows come home, it's not really going to make any bit of a difference. Because of Town Law Section 291. And Town Law Section 291 is really the primary driver here and what we're going to be talking about today. The, the Town Law Section 291 really deals with three classes of cemeteries. Um, and so there are the types of cemeteries in New York are broken into three classes. But we're really only going to talk about the most common scenario here today because there's a lot of nuance and detail to some of these. And um, I want to talk about the real practical experiences that most of you are going to deal with. 290, 290 really leaves uh, very little wiggle room. So the total of any parcel that uh, was a burial ground for the space of 14 years shall be in, deemed sit in the town and shall be subject to the same manner corporate property of the towns, um, government direction of the town board, et cetera. Um, so you're gonna ha it shall be the duty of the town to remove the grass and weeds from any such cemetery or burial ground uh, three times a year and erect them and maintain suitable fences around such cemetery or burial grounds. So we're talking about uh, public, public cemetery burial grounds that are, uh, you know, for the most part regulated or laid out uh, and uh, as, as public cemeteries. Section 50 of the Not-for-Profit Corporation Law uh, further defines abandoned cemeteries, for uh, if you are interested, uh, means cemeteries previously owned by a cemetery corporation pursuant to the chapter um, or membership corporation law which preceded that chapter. And no longer exists, these are important, uh, any corporate board 
benefit funds, trust funds, to maintain the cemetery, and no ability uh, to care for the cemetery. So, really, most are going to experience you know, experience a situation where the town board is going to hear from a group that says, we have $3 million, but nobody else will serve on the board, and, and here it is. Uh, usually not the case. What that municipalities usually see is that they with very little money in their bank account, uh, even at the point of hundreds of dollars, and all of the board members are former board members who are current occupants of the cemetery, uh, maybe one or two board members left who are unable to uh, continue caring for the cemetery, and they're looking for the town. They've done everything they can um, to continue operation. They need the town to take over. Exclude these regions would be religious cemeteries, organized uh, religious cemeteries, family cemeteries, or private cemeteries. And many folks I hear from all the time are talking to me about, um, you know, my cousin has got a cemetery in his backyard. And the town has to take it over. And is this a separate, separately deeded parcel? Is it identified on a tax map? Is there any easement or grant of that property? Almost always that is not the case. Um, cousin Billy is responsible um, for that cemetery. But what is Con V. Boylan, and, uh, which says a cemetery that was originally organized as a family cemetery but was mapped out and divided into sections and plots uh, and sold to the general public become a public cemetery. And those also apply. I have one in my community. Um, I have one adjacent to an existing abandoned cemetery where uh, the family, one of the families in the 1800s got irritated with one of the other families who was running the cemetery to so open their own cemetery, but made it a family cemetery, uh, and then eventually mapped the whole cemetery out on a big roll of butcher paper and just started selling graves to their friends. Um, that also has become abandoned recently, and guess what? It's now our responsibility because under Convy Boylan, it actually became a public cemetery. So it is our responsibility to uh, cut the expenses, maintain the cemetery. So difference in cemetery types. Um, remembering this fact uh, is extremely critical because there's there are many different types of cemeteries, and many of the, in many of these cases, best intentions of, of um, forcing on maintenance or operations of the cemetery uh, do not apply. Another point I would make, particularly for municipal officials, and I like to mention this every single time I have you uh, listen to me, is that uh, of individuals on their own property is a uh, home issue. It's a matter of local zoning. So please don't allow grandma to be buried in the backyard. Um, I call all the time from municipalities every single month where there's some local land use crisis because somebody decided that it was a great idea to put grandma in the backyard or uh, sell or somebody. And what they do is it's about Many of these cemeteries that you're now facing uh, problems with, and, uh, and this has become more of a problem uh, in 2018 because we have situations where uh, people are cremated and cremated remains are certainly much easier to dispose of than a full body burial. So people are putting in, um, you know, bones and, and doing burials in their backyard, which again is allowed uh, by local zoning authority. They're not providing any easement to visit those graves, you know, access from another road uh, in case that somebody wants to go visit that uh, loved one. And mostly they're not, not passing off the area. They're not providing a separate uh, state parcel for us. And it's headaches all the time. I get calls. Uh, I'm having a barbecue in my backyard. There's this woman crying with flowers in my backyard. I want her taken away. Um, these people are trespassing. You need to get rid of them. And there's concepts, particularly upstate, I know it very well, that the family farm is going to stay the family farm forever, or the family homestead has been the family homestead for four generations. I'd like to put that in the backyard. It'll always be in the family. Um, there are divorces. There are fires. There are many things uh, that impact 
our relationships to those properties and shifts. Certainly with societal, the, the break we talked about previously, and, and other issues in, in the state will actually having to leave to find employment elsewhere. Uh, they don't have, they won't have that, you know, connection to the property or the maintenance of that property uh, in mind. And so it's usually not an option for full body burial to just pick up and move them somewhere else. Uh, so, you know, this is an extremely important thing for municipalities to consider that if you have the ability, local regulate burials. Um, to put them uh, in cemeteries, or if you're allowing bears in uh, private property, be required to provide uh, proof of access, uh, perhaps as a surveyed separate parcel, um, so that is designated and clear uh, when there is a property transaction. I hear also hear from people who are surprised discover because it's not on anything. Uh, maps or uh, other documentation, then they stumble across a gravestone on their property that's fairly recent. And, um, that you know, you find that people have uh, interred someone as they were leaving, and uh, you know, it's now a problem for the folks who are still there. So, towns step in, and again, as we said earlier, don't expect any kind of warning in this situation. It's extremely important. Uh, we engage early. I've said it a few times, and uh, there's a reason I keep saying it, is that we have to be uh, preparing for what might be coming down the road. That said, everything is going to be okay. Uh, there is some work to do for municipalities. It's mostly on the front end uh, of these abandonments, and, and I'll give you um, when you experience it from the beginning and you do it properly, uh, be, there becomes a way in which you can uh, create your own template that's uh, particularly your municipality and how to handle these other um, uh, abandonments. In a encourage your boards to legislate and regulate generally. And by legislate and regulate generally, I mean be as general as you can in your regulations. Um, you're going to create your rules, um, your fees, that you can cover uh, the different types of cemeteries that you might have to encounter um, as you're taking over within your community. Again, going back to how you should be um, an eye on uh, the different types of cemeteries that are facing problems in your community. So it's important to do that because you don't have to have the boards continuing to pass different rules and regulations for any uh, cemetery you're going to be taking over. You want to apply apply an equal uh, rules and regulations schedule across those entities. It makes it so much easier for the clerks and um, their town officials that are involved in, in the takeovers or village, village folks uh, as well. So municipalities are going to need some tools uh, in order to to do this, and these are, it's a significant list, and certainly the resources available to you. Uh, one of them is, it's extremely important, it's not, has not been done enough, and I can't stress this enough. It's extremely important that if there is an actual abandonment, so there's a board coming to you, or there's a representative of the board coming to a municipality, and you say, and they, they want to have the town take it over, you should have the board do a resolution to officially take over the cemetery. The extremely important in the actual process as well as applications for funding so they can prove there was a date specific um, time you took over this abandoned cemetery, that it wasn't some nebulous thing that town has been doing it for 20 years. You should do an actual resolution for the takeover. And we'll talk about that that's important in a few minutes. Uh, also, you'll need to set rates and charges you should set the based on really practical um, associated with um, any actual services, and you should also look at the other other cemeteries in the area so that you can set them appropriately. Um, just because the board thinks it's a great idea, it saves for five thousand dollars, so you can make a lot of money for the town. But the graves are selling for three hundred dollars in your community. Um, you need to keep the, obviously keep that in mind. Rules. I urge you to look at 
uh, rules and regulations within your community. Uh, the existing rules and regulations, all these regulated not-for-profit cemeteries are, are required to have these rules and regulations. Um, try to model them as closely to that as possible. That solves a lot of headaches, but you also look through the lens of your municipal, municipal government to understand um, you know, we want to do cleanups, um, what we want to do to kind of control the situation within the cemetery to the benefit of the municipality for their operations. One of the things I strongly encourage municipalities to do is to create a monument installation application. I would usually go through your building department, no matter how small it is. I have one guy, um, but with a form application. And uh, that ties in exactly with our rules and regulations on what's allowed in the cemetery for monuments. Um, obviously, you want, in many instances, you want monuments to kind of, um, you know, end with the other monuments in the in the uh, cemetery. And it also lets you uh, application essentially from usually from the monument dealers. They give it to the towns. Uh, where the face picked out a monument, they went to the monument dealer, the monument dealer gives them, does the application. You're allowed to then review the application to make sure, they give you a, essentially the monument dealers give you a sketch of what the monument is. So the municipality then has some kind of control um, that gravestone isn't a giant carved expletive or something like that. Um, that would be extremely inappropriate for the community and certainly for the town, so you can have some control of that. And we charge a nominal fee uh, for that. Uh, the monument dealers pay it as a course. Uh, the course of doing business It's usually passed on to the family, um, which just covers the cost of the processing by your building inspector. But again, it's just another stopgap that allows you to be able to um, control what's going on in the cemetery. Uh, Admits as well. You're going to have to create those. You can utilize the existing ones um, that are already being used. But they have to be changed uh, to comport with the needs, the legal requirements of the local municipality. So your town council is going to have to be involved in that. Um, and many municipalities uh, create form documents for, in this regard. Uh, retention and organization is extremely important. You know, you know what you actually have. I have this is where. Town is simply handed a shoebox and says, and they, you know, the person says, "Here's your cemetery. We're done." Uh, and then the town clerk is required to go through uh, all those materials. The scenario I've actually seen ledgers as well as detailed maps and they're handwritten and that says, you know, outline which graves are being utilized and who's in them. It's important to really get an understanding as soon as possible as to inventory you have and also. Um, how many graves are sold? Um, so that you know what your expectation is that you have these graves that have been sold. No one's been putting them yet. That you may have a number of uh, burials coming down the road. Um, so uh, certain records retention and um, organizing that material is going to be extremely important and, and uh, being able to really create an inventory analysis. It doesn't have to be anything um, beautiful or technical, but just giving you an idea of graves you have available, and certainly that will inform your ability as to whether or not you're, um, you're selling graves, how much uh, inventory you have, and the ability to build um, town funds to for the term maintenance of the cemetery. Also, for takeover, helps you with an application for state funds. And that's extremely important because uh, there is um, a time that you need to keep in mind uh, for abandoned cemetery funds. Um, it's important, again, if there is a abandonment, you get in writing. Um, get the person, if it's one person left in the cemetery board who's, you know, they've done this for four years, they're done, they can't do it anymore. Um, get them to write a letter to the town board that is, or the village board that says uh, the sole remaining member of the board, these are our assets. Uh, I request that the town uh, or village take over 
the cemetery at a certain. There's no requirement in statute that that's, that's done, and in many cases it's not, but it's extremely um, problematic in the long term. I would about earlier uh, for the town board to acknowledge that letter and the abandonment in a resolution. Again, that, that abandonment resolution really starts a time clock that's important um, going forward. I would make sure that a lot of owners in the public are aware of what the town board is doing or the village board, um, and I always encourage a board workshop where the public is invited uh, to participate and uh, can understand why the cemetery um, is going ahead with the event and why the town is going to take over, and certainly what the town intends to do um, with the actual abandonment. So one about uh, um, municipal cemetery once it transitions from being a, a uh, public cemetery is that there's no more state reporting. So um, many times there are state reports that get submitted uh, that have never been submitted or they're past due and that someone will tell you, oh, I never did these reports, you have to fill them out and send them into the state. That is not the case. Uh, once the cemetery is abandoned, it becomes a municipal cemetery. Um, unless you have a crematory on the facility, it's pretty much your responsibility uh, forward. Cemetery management we touched on. Um, it's really going to be your town clerk or village clerk who's going to be the person who will be uh, unhappily uh, going through all of the, the uh, materials for the cemetery and trying to make sense of them and provide some insight to the town board. Uh, obviously, the historian. Uh, can be a tremendous uh, uh, for you in uh, doing some of this work. Talked about their graves. Uh, one of the other things that's important to note is that in many instances there's reviews of uh, or review possible of copies of deeds, uh, grave transfers. Certainly the clerk's office aerial uh, permits that are filed with them. Uh, that give you insight. If it sounds like it's it's like a labor-intensive deal. If you don't have good records, it really is. Um, but again, inventory is important you know, so that you know what you have and what you can sell. And obviously, you don't want to be selling the same thing twice. So you need to create a surcharge and price list, the installation application, uh, cherry rules and regulations, and a deed. Um, check. The check records for uh, examples of different documents and have a place to start. That's a place of consistency. You don't have to be um, created from nothing, but there are resources available, certainly online, um, to be able to create these documents, and certainly professional help is available. The financial, and, and this is really goes back to. Um, what we talked on the ability of municipalities to assist um, the general the municipal assistance bill before the amendment takes place even. I think that's one thing we should mention. One of the most difficult things for some board members on cemeteries to uh, handle is just the requirements for the finances, um, really keeping on a, tr a track from a treasurer's perspective on what's being done. Um, perhaps folks are getting older and it's more difficult with types of transactions that need to be done and some of the um, onboarding or bank statements. The thing that a municipality can really do to help these struggling cemeteries, if a cemetery needs is some uh, bookkeeping expertise um, so that the board will stay on the board and they continue operating, that's something really easy that a municipality can do. Um, why that's easy is because municipalities already have uh, the controller's approved financial reporting system from their general operating statements uh, that they can input uh, information fairly easily and provide reports necessary for cemetery reporting. Um, keep in mind these are small cemeteries. They don't have a lot of uh, business activity. So uh, that assistance is fairly limited from the town. It doesn't require a really a lot. I, I represent a small community, 
and you know, even my small community has hundreds of vouchers perhaps in a month, so you know, getting a few more to it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, municipal accounting and operating uh, statements are already developed um, to help you with uh, new cemeteries. You already have places to report under your cemetery fund operating statement. Um, obviously, to, to uh, view the bank and corporate records, it's extremely important to get a full financial picture over these cemeteries so you understand um, really what is lurking there in the background, if there's any loans that are due or payments that are due. Um, and one of the things that gets overlooked all the time is to actually uh, search the controller's abandoned property uh, section on their, on their website. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times uh, organizations, even municipalities, can find funds. And if you're looking over a cemetery, even $500 is a welcome addition. One of the other municipalities, you're going to have to decide who's going to have the actual burial rights. Um, you can, you're can, you going to need to decide based on the uh, number of graves that are available. If uh, you, know, you open it up to the general public or residents of the town, um, you need to really just determine who's going to have those burial rights. So one of the big you're going to face too is who's going to do the actual work uh, and something that is really unique to each individual municipality because there are certainly fiscal challenges that you're going to have to address uh, on your own board level levels. You're going to figure out who's going to mow. Um, you're going to do the house. You're going to the department do it. Um, you, you know, are they capable of doing it? Are you going to, you know, be able to get some other company that is uh, providing these services in rural areas to take it over for a fee? Uh, it's important to note, and, and in my community, I have one cemetery where uh, um, I'm having the highway department do it, and they don't have the time to do it. But we have another cemetery, uh, they take the mow, and it's because it's very small. It's a mental health <laughs> exercise that you get a chance, somebody gets a chance to go out on a uh, riding mower and do some work. Uh, so you're also going to have to interact with your highway department or your parks department and how to uh, figure out who's going to be doing the mowing. And obviously, uh, your contractual obligations, if you're a unionized community, are going to impact uh, the ability to uh, have a discussion. You're going to talk about digging, um, which is a fairly technical job. And it's extremely difficult. Usually in small rural areas, if you have an operational cemetery, there's a firm probably doing this for, you know, a dozen or more cemeteries where they're going in and they're digging graves at need. Uh, there are specific requirements. Um, if there are people who are um, on your this, so I would strongly encourage you to only have someone who is experienced doing this, but there's something that you're going to have to think about. Uh, uh, municipalities to require grave liners or vaults, it really should not be an option uh, for folks, and uh, that is because the ground cells, if you, you, know, you go to the older cemeteries, you'll see how the ground uh, is divot, that's where the, the, the boxes have collapsed, and uh, it's creates a maintenance headache where you have to keep going back and uh, filling in those graves. Uh, the layers of the vaults uh, prevent that settling, uh, make it to maintain, certainly for the long term. Um, so just be pretty standard across the state. Uh, most cemeteries do require at least grave liners, and uh, it will make a difference. That's not a town. It, is, it can be a town requirement, but it's not a town cost. The uh, person uh, will obviously have to be paying for that. You all may be taking over the cemetery, but it's important to know you don't own the headstones. Under the under state law, the, uh, that's property of uh, the family that put it up there. Um, and that's the case after the town takes over the 
cemetery. So we have specific issues that you're dealing with monuments uh, with our cemetery that are either in a dangerous condition or in need of repair, you should be following basic notification uh, procedures within our uh, official town newspaper. There are ways to structure those notices if you're having problems, if there are multiple problems uh, in the cemetery to create a more cost-effective notice um, that really goes across, uh, you know, sort of uh, numbers of monuments that note, put the fan notice that, that work needs to be done. Note is that if um, the gravestone that you're having issues with, um, that there are um, certain owners' insurance policies to act, that will actually cover those monuments. The insurers don't like to admit that that is the case, but in many instances for the newer stones, uh, some of these policies do they cover um, these types of situations. Policies that are um, really take over abandoned cemeteries to consider the rising cremation rates and how to capitalize on any income associated with that. And it, again, it will offset expenses. Cremation rate in Grand Hill, uh, is going to provide less revenue. And folks are looking at opportunities like a columbarium that you see here, uh, where cremated remains are allowed to be memorialized um, and really provide a revenue stream, an ongoing revenue stream for very little maintenance uh, and option. These, these can be assembled very, fairly quickly. They're very low maintenance. Um, are very nice, and they can take up a portion of your cemetery. If you have a little area where there's a rock outcropping or a difficult place that you'd be able to actually even do burials anyway, um, could be a good way to capitalize on revenue. Um, again, very expensive for the size and uh, very low maintenance. I hear many folks who take over abandoned cemeteries doing nothing with the cemetery is their primary desire and what they will make the responsibility of the town to be. And that's, you know, more understandable if there is no burial space. You're taking over an ancient burial space that is, uh, you know, devoid of empty graves. Um, certainly more uh, in that regard. Columbarium still is a possibility. But cemetery or mausoleum or a community mausoleum additional space, um, just really not an option. Uh, including the, ga the gates is not an option because you're going to have to serve the families that are still there. Uh, and you're going to have to pay the bills. You have to figure out revenue coming into the municipality uh, to help offset the cost of maintaining that burial ground. And certainly uh, you're going to have situations where um, you're going to have folks who are going to the purchase graves, you may not even know about them because there's no deed recorded or you can't find anything, um, but may have, um, you know, a deed to, you know, it's a four lot and only two of them are used, that you've got to expect that those graves will eventually be utilized. The ways that you can really uh, take the this new cemetery operation is to reach out to local funeral directors, engage them in any marketing that you have. Um, but again, they can warn you about outstanding burials that may come down the road. I, I've heard from many funeral directors who have said, oh, you know, Mrs. Smith was buried there two years ago. Mr. Smith's not doing so great. You know, can we talk to you about you now the town's taking it over? You know, what I need to do. And usually um, that's a really good way to just to find out. Funeral directors are very engaged in your community about um, learning um, their revenue stream is going to be as well. So they, they're interested in um, really how to make it easier. But you want to make it easy for them on how to bring this business to you. And again, this goes to along the same lines of updating deed work and that sort of thing, but making it consistent again against uh, your cemetery operations. But if you can, if you're going to clean up the cemetery, make it operational, um, make it look better than it did before, that's certainly going to be a benefit to you. 
uh, for marketing perspective, and the funeral directors respond to it. It becomes something else for them to, to sell. I would say I cannot stress enough that whatever you do related to grave sales, funerals, or anyone else, that you get payment up front. Uh, in a municipal operation, payment should be made up front. Um, one example, in my community, we, we took over a that has recently been abandoned. Um, after the, the abandonment, they called and said, um, I have a burial for you. The uh, husband has died. Uh, the wife is still alive. But I have two graves, and they want to get in uh, as soon as possible. And you have to be, you do the, the service on Saturday. This was on a Thursday. And we said, fine, please come see the clerk. She will take care of uh, the processing, the payment, and um, contact our digger. We get the name of the digger, and uh, we'll make arrangements to have the burial proceed. Friday came. The guy had not shown up to pay his uh, associated with the grave opening and for the uh, other plot services. But cemetery noticed the grave had already been opened and it was prepared for burial. So um, that night we closed the cemetery as usual and locked it and called the funeral director and said, you haven't paid these that you already collected from the family. If you pay them in advance of the funeral, you will not go in the cemetery. That got attention. <laughs> And suddenly um, the comment was, well, you're not open on Saturday. And we said, we're open for you. And we were glad to accept his check early in the morning before and the funeral went on without um, any delay. But it's important to note that uh, once the body is in the ground, it's extremely difficult to cover any funds associated with that burial. So always get payment up front, just like the other municipal service. So as we've discussed, aren't usually interested in abandoned cemeteries, and the tax cap obviously doesn't help. Uh, many small municipalities across upstate face uh, extremely small dollar amounts in their tax cap, and uh, obviously that is a problem. Then over abandoned burial grounds is going to lead you into financial disaster. We talked about that there is a one-time and significant aid available to municipalities. That's the abandoned fund. Uh, that, that's kind of how we call it. It's an important and valuable tool. It's actually called the New York State Cemetery Vandalism Restoration Monitor and Repair Removal and Administration Fund, or that acronym, which I'm not even going to say. And um, obviously, it's New York, so we make all of our words as long, or all of our titles as long as possible. Uh, but this goes um, back to what we had talked about previously. This is a one-time ability a municipality to apply to for a grant for a particular cemetery. For restoration, for ease of maintenance and operation, it's an incredibly valuable tool. There's a time limit uh, for the application of these funds, and when this goes back to what I said previously about the importance of getting a resolution from the town board that accepts the abandonment of the cemetery, and say accepts, I use that in loose terms because you're going to have to accept it. But getting the resolution, um, you have a certain that you can show the state that you took over that cemetery, say, two years ago, um, because state policy currently prohibits applications of, uh, five years old um, or late that would, uh, you could apply for these funds. So it's extremely important that you plan ahead. Certainly, if you're interested in an application of these funds um, for the amendment, I would start the process um, as soon as possible. Funds are important uh, for, this, for this application. It's a pretty simple application. The cemetery division staff is extremely helpful in walking municipalities uh, through this process. The, the application, I believe, is online at the division of, uh, Department of State website. Um, really what this uh, um, will do is it will allow you to get um, dangerous monuments fixed, uh, monuments and walkways, and and in areas uh, removed uh, or restored so that you can do ease of maintenance, uh, deal with fencing, 
with some equipment issues, if you have uh, mowers or um, backhoes or similar things that are only going to be specifically used for the cemetery. Um, I've seen cemeteries apply for equipment sheds to the house or materials um, and for complex um, restrictions, see tree removal, um, surveys uh, for there's no fencing. In the particular case of Brainerd Cemetery we talked about earlier, Willage had refused to take over that cemetery. Um, the town went in and really utilized that opportunity uh, to be to set on a major thoroughfare in the town, a chase. We went in and had, uh, there were many dead trees that were overhanging the cemetery, so you almost didn't even know there was a cemetery there. Um, all the trees were removed, the stumps were ground down, uh, the monuments were restored. Um, to pay for uh, seating and some other things, but uh, we surveyed to find the boundaries of the cemetery because there was an old page wire fence that was basically, uh, at that point, had been taken down by a number of tree branches, that sort of thing. And, uh, they also paid to have, we had a uh, black um, chain link fence and gate installed all around the cemetery. And um, a lot while the survey was done, so we made sure that we put the that we fencing on the actual property of the cemetery, the folks in the survey discovered that back in the early 1900s, a neighbor of the cemetery, as a gift, gave an additional area for about 25 graves to the cemetery, which had the previously existing fence. And so we immediately added it to our inventory for the cemetery. And so a cemetery, which really had been a tremendous eyesore became uh, an, an attractive opportunity for the, the municipality to uh, mark history as well as uh, some more burials. In fact, we had uh, neighbors come by while the work was being done and expressed interest in buying burial space because um, they saw how great the cemetery was coming out and that it was attractive. Volunteers also contributed to place a historic marker um, and, and, and that whole project cost uh, was about $40,000, $38,000 of the funds came from the State Abandoned Cemetery Fund. So a valuable tool uh, to take advantage of. It is a limited opportunity to uh, be able to access those funds. So planning that is extremely important. So simple tools to aid in restoration, I just want to touch on uh, creating a Veterans Monument Restoration Fund, many municipalities do this, um, allows you to really uh, restore funds, uh, restore the, the monuments uh, within your municipal cemeteries. a great way to um, build community interest in uh, the restoration of the cemeteries, and it's extremely important um, for around the holidays that people see a real transformation in some of the, the monuments uh, within your cemetery. I think it's a great marketing opportunity. For municipalities, uh, community service opportunities. I get folks that come to municipalities all the time looking for community service project ideas. Um, obviously, are um, ways in which you can um, look for certain uh, criminal courts within the town to use some of those services. And I think one of the best uh, things for us. Uh, for a municipality is getting press about some of the restoration work being done, particularly from volunteers, uh, to build interest in a particular cemetery to get folks uh, interested in that part of the history of the town, but an interest in perhaps uh, to the next point, which would be memorial and restoration gifts or donations, which some restoration projects uh, within our community. Uh, we've received some press about some of the work that was being done by volunteers. Um, and you know, several years ago, I received a call where someone had seen a, uh, was home visiting friends, and it's, they live in Florida, a piece on the 6 o'clock news about a veterans memorial project. Um, so grandparents were buried in the cemetery and wanted to send the town $2,000. Well, that was $2,000 more than we had uh, when we took over the cemetery, so we certainly were happy to accept it. Uh, it allowed, and uh, um, you'd have to talk to a tax prof professional, but, but uh, deductible uh, so under certain limits of the tax law as a contribution to the town. Friend contributions are strongly encouraged. Uh, many uh, operations in the state um, 
have friends of groups, so nonprofit groups who can raise money, uh, or you know, this could be a local historic group as well uh, that can provide contributions for um, some of the work being done in uh, Ontario. So certainly, other groups should be uh, engaged and encouraged to participate in the restoration process. Are authorized under state law, Section 165 of the General Municipal Law, allows uh, for uh, volunteer cemetery maintenance and cleanup programs. State Division of Cemeteries can provide some very limited assistance. Uh, a volunteer efforts spark interest. If somebody talks in the age of social media, if someone's posting pictures about the gravel they did cleaning gravestones, um, and you see the results, um, you can uh, spark across the community for doing further work. And there is a chemical out there called D2, which is a biological solution, uh, which does a remarkable job at taking off um, pollution, lichens and things. It's very um, easy and doesn't have a, um, the same sorts of effects other chemicals would by killing the grass or um, bob skin. And I think those are those of um, projects where D2 is utilized and things are posted on the internet, people see how you can really make a huge difference on some of these cemeteries. And obviously, if you're, if you're working on any of these gravestones, doing it to, at the front cemetery first, where people see it, is a certainly great way to engage uh, folks in your community in doing uh, some of the restoration. Again, I sort of really partner with communities. Uh, municipalities need to be welcoming uh, to volunteer, which is not always an easy thing to do. Um, and most general town policies uh, cover volunteer efforts. I mean, it may be part of your general town policy um, to cover some of this work. Uh, obviously, there are limits, but I would encourage you to contact your insurance broker because, uh, certainly in our case, uh, that uh, the volunteer organizations that were helping us were covered within. Uh, Working within our cemeteries to to us. That's one of the impacts that you know the restoration partners do add value and uh, return costs when volunteers are doing this. This is an example of the D2. It's just one app, you know, one application in uh, front of the cemetery, and you had something that, that was almost unrecognizable and it really and uh, really gets the attention of folks within the community. Occasionally, to say we want a cemetery, we want to take over these cemeteries. We want we want the town to take over more cemeteries. Um, we want our town to take over one area that you didn't talk about, a historic burial ground, perhaps that, that was a private cemetery. Um, this is extremely important and a focal point in the community. And is that possible? Absolutely, it is possible under Section 1506J of the Not-for-Profit Corporation Law. City, believe, town, village. They conduct the acquisition. Uh, as long as the board of the cemetery unanimously agrees to the transfer, the municipality has to formally vote to accept it. The cemetery is then dissolved and is dissolved into the local government just like any municipal cemetery. So it becomes a municipal cemetery. There's a state complaint from 2002 that they have, uh, localities have the authority to acquire historic cemetery properties also as a gift. And uh, the property must fall within the definition of a historic and or cultural place or property as deemed in Article 5K of the General Municipal Law. It is a fairly large um, it <laughs> definition. It, there is a lot of room in there for you to be able to uh, take over some of these historic burial grounds. Again, something to contact, um, have your town board, town supervisor discuss the matter with their local Council. Um, and another opinion from 1987 uh, on the local law option that towns may be able to take over abandoned private burial grounds. Passing a local law, Section 2, 291 1, by amending uh, it to be applicable to private burial grounds. So this would be a case outside the historic piece where towns have decided that there are specific burial grounds that you want to uh, take over. And you have to pass a local law to allow uh, the takeover of those private burial grounds. Again, they're a bit uh, public entities. 
many say this is a lot of information and we need help. And there are there consultants available, are there people available that can help us out with this? Uh, certainly there are. Uh, that's what we do. There are resources uh, online as well. Um, I can tell you that the Town of Nassau website, it's my community, townofnassau.org, under uh, Town of Terry's, has a number of documents, rules and regulations, uh, some of these forms we've talked about, um, some of the resolution information, those are available on the website. And obviously, uh, never steal a bad idea, so certainly I would take advantage of those as template documents, certainly to be um, reviewed by uh, someone with technical expertise to be able to make them come local requirements. Information um, in a short period of time. I know we have, uh, have several questions about a lot of the stuff uh, that we've talked about. I'm going to be happy to answer any questions uh, that are posed as well as um, you know, certain available uh, from a professional perspective if uh, someone needs uh, detailed assistance. Uh, certainly read us my, my information is uh, in front of you there. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do have a question um, that came from the town of Mexico. Um, the, a cemetery on the grounds of the Oswego County Boces in Mexico, New York. There are 40 people buried there, maybe up to 100. They were there when the site was the Oswego County home home uh, for the poorhouse or the poorhouse um, from the early 1800s. Osties bought it, purchased the property in the 1960s. The cemetery was never cared for after Bosey's purchased the property and is overgrown. The question is, who is responsible for this cemetery and who has the legal responsibility to, to manage and maintain this piece of history? Um. There's a straightforward answer because it really depends on if we if you hearken back to what we had talked about earlier in the presentation, um, it depends or not the parcel has been divided off that, that contains the graves, and if right. that's provide provided, um, most likely there was not. Uh, the in this case um, it is a private burial ground. If it was utilized by use was a county parcel. Um, the county won't assume responsibility for it, but the landowner should be taken care of and it should, should be fenced off. Okay. Um, we I had another comment or question. It was it. Um, it says all plots are sold in cemetery. If a plot sold 50 years ago and the intended person to be buried was 99 years old 30 years ago, can a plot be resold? If death record and burial records for that attendee are found, can we resell the plot after verification that the person was buried elsewhere? Is there a length of time that the plot can be filled or would that fall into the rules and regulations of the cemetery? And whether or not it is a um, regulated cemetery. So not-for-profit cemeteries are allowed to reclaim abandoned graves. They're specifically called abandoned graves. Um, but municipal cemeteries are, do not fall under that category. Okay. I, just, I think I just shared that with everyone. Um, what's okay? Our our two cemeteries. I am a town clerk and have not located any rules or regulations for our cemeteries. Is the template of regulations our current board could adopt? So, um, I encourage you to go on, like I said earlier, the Town of Nassau website. It's my municipal website, townofnassau.org. We have rules and regulations, um, which really are the basic regulations because our cemeteries have very low. Um, rates. So we've created basically a, a template that you can utilize to add and subtract to um, for municipal purposes. I encourage folks to utilize that as a template. It would have to be um, it have to be tailored to your own municipality. 
municipality. Um, then we did have a question. Since you are recording this course, will it be available online again to share with more interested persons? And um, we do plan to share this with the one that had registered via email, and we will also post it onto Tug Hill Commission's webpage. Check to see. Is there any other? Cemetery take land by eminent domain. Can a cemetery take property by eminent domain? No, the town can. So if a town needed to expand the cemetery by need, there is a process by which the town could could take uh, land for real purposes. It's very so detailed and, and uh, litigious process. Okay. Um. I turning it off off of mute to see if if we have questions uh, verbal questions because I'm not seeing any more um, any more the, the chats here so uh, let's see we'll unmute all anybody did have have a question they wanted to ask but weren't sure how to do it in the chat box ask it verbally. Well, thank David for a very, very interesting webinar. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for us. Yeah, it was, it was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. It does say we did have another one, another comment. It says, even the town does not own the cemetery, the land. And I'm sorry. If the town does not own the cemetery, what was the last part? Um, are you on the on the line? And Perot? Hey, yep. What? What part of the question? Oh, okay. So it says, even if the town does not own the cemetery, gift the land? Uh, if, if the town can't gift the cemetery to anyone else. Uh, and they certainly can't gift municipal property. So you can't provide um, graves as a gift uh, to any. There is a there is a value. I think it's important to note too for folks who are on the line still with us that um, one of the big problems that folks are facing who run right not for profit regulated cemeteries these days is that um, rising cremation rates. They're finding uh, clear and present evidence. Uh, that someone has scattered the remains of someone else on the graves. Doing so obviously do not incur charges and doing so without permission. And uh, that, that is a real problem. One of my colleagues was telling me how they, they came into the cemetery um, after Mother's Day and the, uh, there was actually a plastic shopping bag and the handles were still sticking up out of the sod and when they pulled it up, uh, it was full of cremated remains. Someone had uh, buried the person there. And one that showed me a uh, pic from after Mother's Day where a large monument with two stone pieces on either side as part of the monument. And when they walked by, there was an urn place in each of those stone vases. Someone had just dropped off the remains. Obviously, that's a problem. Um, but where uh, cemeteries that are taken over by municipalities have an advantage is that with a little uh, the tech work to find out whose grave it was, you can reach out to folks with a with a nice form letter that indicates because uh, it is municipal, municipal property and they're essentially taking a, a service for which there is a fee. It's actually a felony. It's a theft of government service. So if they'd be happy to drop off a check at the clerk's office for the dollar amount, uh, we'd be pleased to accept it without any further action. That usually resolves that situation rather quickly. Did that answer your question? Not seeing anything else, but he did mention after I had read that that it was a follow up to the eminent domain question. So, the so town accept the gift of property um, in addition to uh, you know to add on to the existing cemetery. Yes, yeah, that is a lot.
Jean? Yeah? Yes. This is Dee Davies. Okay. I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. It's in regard to the Poor House Cemetery. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. It has, okay. has been abandoned. There's a website, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with it or not. It's called Find a Grave. Yep. Okay. On the Find a Grave, I think there are 42 list names that are in this cemetery. Mm -hmm. I think there are several more. It's probably quite a few more. But in 1970-71, Oswego County BOCES purchased that property. It was Poor House. Um, it was owned by the county. At the time, they tore the poor house down, and they were told that the cemetery was there. However, it's been abandoned since 1970-71, and we've been working for about four or five years trying to get them to clear that land off and um, fence it. I think that we can do more than what, what we've been going through. Who are trying to get to act? Pardon me? Get uh, to on fencing it. What entity? Well, actually, my husband started out with um, the individual, uh, Oswego County BOCES, because he was for BOCES, and it was just recently he found out that the cemetery was there. So he's been working on this for about, hmm, I'd say, four or five years. And he's gone to the superintendent, but some for some reason, I don't know what the problem is, that they don't want to respond to us or they don't want to clear it off or, you know, is anyone else that we can go to for help? I would go to, I would certainly um, contact the county executive if it was county burial ground and express him uh, for the problem. And so uh, he can relay that to the county attorney. To county attorney? Yes. Okay. It'd be up to him or her to to, to pass along. Um, to got, you know, express your concern and that you think there's uh, potential responsibility on the part of the county if this was a county property. I have seen in, pa in the past in more recent transactions, certainly not in something this old. Um, where a transaction occurred where there was no disclosure of the of a uh, former almshouse burial ground or something along those lines, where the transactions were actually unwound, or there was a requirement that the uh, seller was required to do the maintenance of the cemetery. So I have seen that in, in recent times, but uh, certainly not in a transaction that occurred 40 years ago. Yeah, I think that's where the problem uh, lies. I think a lot of those records were destroyed. Um, they s seem to be able to find them in bits and pieces, but we were wondering if that maybe the town of Mexico would take it over or the village of Mexico. Um, yeah, they would have to take it over voluntarily. They wouldn't be required to if it's not a separate, separate parcel. Okay. Now, my other thing was is the way this all about was they said that the cemetery was under the bus garage, and my husband went and researched it and got all these uh, aerial maps from, um, I'm thinking, 1938 on up to designate where this plot of land was. And there was also a maintenance supervisor of towns when BOCES was started that knew where the cemetery was and told them not to dig in that spot because of the heavy equipment um, glass, told them not to dig there because there's a cemetery. So that's how we know where the cemetery is. It's kind of overgrown now, and mine has been working at trying to get them <laughs> to, you know, recognize it and fence it in, but I don't know. I guess probably, like you said, go to the county attorney would be the first thing. Yeah, the county executive to, talk, to get them to uh, direct it to the county attorney. 
Okay. Well, we have a county legislator that I don't know who asked the question first one on the poorhouse, and it could very well have been our county legislator that did it. So, you know, I'll go to him and see what he can do from there on. Yep. Great. <laughs> other than that, other than my husband writing all kind of letters, but it's kind I think of that's really annoying that no one wants to do anything about it. That's sure. not great. Does anybody else have any other questions for David? Uh, thank you, Jean. Um, if there's no other questions, I'd like to uh, thank David again for uh, your time on this and all your expertise. It's a uh, it's an interesting topic and one that it has a lot of uh, questions and angles and <laughs> all sorts of things. But thank you, David. Sure, thank you for having me. And with that, we will conclude the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.